different groups, a number of different groups were added, such as wood, uh, separate, wood eating beetles, uh, bees, butterflies, and so on. And in each case, for plants, birds, and mammals that had been surveyed in, 20, in the 1990s, fewer species were found um, in the recent survey, species that had been that had been, um, there were a few exceptions, of course, like the horsefield flying squirrel, which had, had been overlooked in the 1990s survey, turns out to be actually fairly um, abundant in Bukitima. But by and large, there were decreases in those groups that had been surveyed in, 19, in the early 1990s. And as for these groups that were surveyed for the first time, uh, the research, research teams found that, for example, Dr. Xiong Lung Fa, who did the beetle survey, or Dr. John Asher's team who did the bee survey, they found that um, in other parts of Singapore, larger forested areas like the central catchment would have more species of bees and beetles. Some common things that you might expect to find in a primary forest were absent from Bukitima. So clearly there's been species loss and it continues the so-called extinction debt where there's a continuing loss of species or so it seems, but nonetheless, the diversity is surprisingly high, reassuringly high. So it's not a doom and gloom scenario. It's just that Bukitima behaves as you would predict based on reduction in habitat size, shrink a habitat, lose some of the diversity over time. Now, on this one, biomass collapse. This was, I, I just need to take a short detour. Much of what we know about tropical fragments forest fragments is informed by this landmark study done in Brazil. It's called the Biodynamics, Biological Dynamics of Tropical Rainforest Fragments. So it's the BDFFP, the bio, yeah, that's, that's the acronym for it. It was started by uh, Tom Lovejoy and colleagues and taken really to fruition by a very well-known conservation biologist named Bill Lawrence. They basically found that when you, once, once you shrink these Amazonian fragments, Here, here's an example from their 1992 introduction to their project. You have tremendous species loss, almost instantaneous collapse of biomass on an unbelievable scale. Uh, it, it's, it's really amazing how fast these habitats collapse. And again, as I was saying earlier, much of what we know or think we know about fragments is informed by this very comprehensive study. So then the question then becomes, did we find at Bukitima what Lawrence and colleagues were discovering much to their horror in Brazil? So here's a, here's a diagram on, this is biomass, so how, mu how many tons of wood uh, do you have above ground? This was done by my colleague Ngo Kang Min. So up on the top, I think that's Asia, and you can see the little arrow shows Bukitima. So Bukitima is slightly lower in, in biomass per unit area compared to other Asian forests, but if you compare to say Africa or Amazonia, it's actually not only comparable, it's, it's, it's would be on the high end of a neotropical forest. So Biomass, for whatever reason, might be slightly lower on the lower side of average, but it's still substantial and there's no suggestion that it collapsed in any way. And likewise, from this almost 30, 20 years of data, 93 to 2012, every indicator that we could think of, did biomass drastically decline over the study period? No. Did we lose any species in our study plots? In fact, no, we added a few. We're in four hectares, over 350 species of trees, which is not as diverse as, say, if you went to Tamanegara per unit area. But then again, Bukitima is a hill, which is dry. You naturally have fewer tree species. So again, I don't refer to animal species. How about numbers of individuals or tree density? And the answer is no, we, we didn't see any decline or any kind of negative trend. So in some ways, you know, you would have assumed a kind of collapse this horrific, of horrific proportions, but we just haven't found it, at least not yet. And, I, and we're fairly confident that this is a resilient system. So that's, that was one of the really encouraging things out of our ongoing study. 
Here's another thing, a species invasion. So if you remember the dairy farm, you take a look at the dairy farm. This is, the, this is done by my colleague, Ku Min Sheng. So the red dots, that's the former dairy farm, which has now been taken over largely by a canopy of an invasive, of a non-native species called the African tulip, which many of you are familiar with. But the African tulip didn't turn up despite colonizing a huge area at the fringes of the reserve. It did not penetrate into the forest proper, the existing native dominated forest, not even in a tree fall gaps. And on top of that, if you look at the understory of the uh, African tulip canopy, it's all native species, suggesting that at some point those invasive plants will be, non-native plants will be replaced by native species. So in that sense, again, just, and, and mind you, there are gardens and parks and waysides all around Bukitima with non-native plants that can easily be dispersed into the forest, and yet we don't see them. So there's a degree of resilience, which was very reassuring. How, and this is interesting too, how about if you take away animals? So I'm thinking particularly of say pollination or seed dispersal. So of course, here's a nutmeg is a classic case. Nutmegs are large seeded plants. This is the genus Meristica, and that seed is about four centimeters across. In a, in a intact forest, this would be dispersed by large, the largest birds like hornbills, and perhaps by gibbons that go for this red fleshy bit that surrounds the seed. Um, of course, those of you who know your birds will say, this is, this can't be, this is the Indian hornbill. It was never found, never found in Singapore. So I was desperate. I had to find a hornbill photo, but yes, we would have had say the rhinoceros hornbill or helmeted perhaps, and they would have been the dispersers. Um, what we did not find is we did not find any evidence that these large seeded fruits were in any way being negatively impacted by the loss of um, their traditional dispersers. And, by negative impacts that would have been, for example, finding lack of regeneration, which uh, but we found regeneration, or maybe the plants would have been more densely aggregated because nobody was moving the seeds. But in fact, the large seeded plants were as, if not more, widely dispersed than smaller seeded. So that was, again, encouraging. And we think that this is one of the, I wouldn't say culprits, the, 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 the helpers, uh, things like plantain squirrel. It's not even a large squirrel, yet it's moving, we think, large seeds. And we've tracked some of these and find that, you know, that they can move things around. So we have to remember there's a balance and it's a funny one because even though we've lost seed dispersers, we've also lost seed predators. And so in a way, the kind of loss cuts both ways and the, the net balance is somewhere maybe like what we had before. It's, it's a really fascinating thing and I think worth a lot more study. The same thing holds with pollination versus seed predation by insects. We're not finding evidence, although we haven't tested it and somebody should, we haven't found evidence of any kind of limitation of seed set based on the, that would be possibly due to the loss of pollinators. I'll speed up uh, Marcus and Kanan. However, this is gonna be really interesting because wild boar have come back. They've been absent they've been absent for decades and have come back in the past five years and they are known to be aggressive uh, seed predators in some places. And the question is, is this fine balance between disperser loss and seed predator loss about to be disrupted by the reintroduction or the reemergence of a um, native, large, fairly voracious uh, seed predator? Uh, last one, this is a study done by Ted Webb's group at NUS, and those squiggly, those lines basically are the movement of pollen. It's just showing that some of this, this tree called Kumpasia or Kumpas, they found Bukitima pollen going all the way to Mekrichi, and in some cases to the Singapore Botanic Gardens. So trees that are pollinated by large, powerful flying pollinators, such as the giant honeybee, don't seem to be limited. And in fact, that there is no uh, sign that there's genetic erosion the best work on genetic erosion has been done by Professor Frank Reins group at NUS on birds. They find that canopy birds are able to maintain a genetic connectivity, but understory birds suffer, suffer quite badly in some cases. So it's, so it's not a case of all animals or all plants suffer equally. It, it depends a lot on life history, but in terms of basic function for the plants like pollination and seed dispersal, it seems as if 
Fukushima manages to function. So uh, this is just, uh, thank you, Nick Baker, for the photo of the red cheek uh, flying squirrel. You know, Bukitima, we're finding things all the time, despite some of the losses. The one on the lower left-hand corner, particularly funny because um, this is a plant that I walked by <laughs> thousands of times. And in 2015, Mati, Mati Nisalo from the Botanic Gardens realized that actually it's a new, newly, it's a species that had not been described before. There's my colleague, Nick Faisu, lower right hand corner with these humongous leaves of the gluta malayana, one of these mango relatives known as rengas. That's hard to miss, but Nick and Minchung discovered this plant in their 2008 survey. It was the first record of the species from Singapore. Now, so what does this car have to do with anything? And I'm going to go into my last slides. This is a 1970 Dodge Charger. This is the car I learned to drive on. Not this particular car, because that's a California license plate. But this is a car my dad had. And uh, by the time he let me drive it in the late 70s, it was starting to kind of fall apart. And I was thinking, you know, if you had a car, and if the job of the car is to just get you from point A to point B, then how much of this car can you start can you dismantle before you can't get to the next place? So maybe you might start with the windscreen wipers. Well, maybe not in Singapore because it rains a lot. But, you know, windscreen wipers on a dry day, you can still get to your destination. You, oops, sorry, I uh, blew it. You could take off the lights, uh, seat belts, the rear view mirror, side view mirror, hubcaps, take out the doors, take out the windows. The margin for safety is, is increasingly you know, smaller and smaller, each part you take out, the indicator lights, but the car will still get you to where you want to go under ideal conditions. You could even take out the engine, you know, Fred Flintstone proves that you can take out the engine and the car will still run. And this is not just a quirk because his best friend, Barney Rubble, also his car had no engine either. So it's true, if you're willing to push the car, you can still get from point A to point B, just like when your car stalls, you gotta give it a push. So likewise, how much can you strip away from a forest ecosystem before the basic functions start to unravel and the forest is not able to sustain itself? And I have to thank my colleagues at NTU, David Wardle, Kelly Anderson, Eleanor Slade, uh, Deepthi, Kangmin, for really helping me think more in, in terms of a system as opposed to species. I'll tell you a rainforest fragment that I think has gotten a little too small to maintain function. This is the Singapore Botanic Rain uh, Forest. It's six hectares. It's still very diverse in tree species, over 300. It doesn't have macaques, which are important disperser. It doesn't have it any longer. It doesn't have them any longer, but it, it has squirrels, but really it doesn't seem to have much movement of seeds. If you look, there seems to have been, despite the fact that there are still some very large trees like this Shoria macroptera, over the years you can see that the canopy has begun to open up, fray a little bit. Uh, there's some big trees not necessarily being replaced by the growth of smaller ones. And so the question is, is this a, is this a forest that has gotten a little too small to be able to sustain itself? We think Bukitima is just about large enough to it. It's got species losses, but it still has been able to, we believe, maintain species forest function. So uh, again, here's some lone dipterocarps. The one on the left is near Thompson Plaza. The one on the right is near the Mandai Crematorium. And if you look at, you know, um, you can see where my, that's Tanga, that's, that's one green patch that's gonna be a lot less green, but here's Bukitima, Bukibato, here's the Bukit Brown area, Singapore Botanic Gardens. We got actually tons of, tons of fragments where we can actually test this out. And if you look at the timeline, here's the recent paper five years ago by a group looking at impacts of fragmentation. Um, much of the work, so you can see it, it's coming from Brazil. The only work in Asia is out of a safe project in, in, in northern Borneo, in, in Sabah, a very recent project. And the other projects really come from um, moss habitat in Canada, um, some experiments in temperate forests in the US and Australia, Kansas. Uh, I think Singapore would be a perfect place to actually look at the impacts of fragmentation on not species loss so much as 
forest function? Can it maintain the basic processes that keep the uh, forest from decaying further? And it, okay, if we were to do a timeline, you can see all the fragmentation was early, almost 200 years ago. And look at these places, Yishu Nature Park, the Southern Ridges, Angmokyo Ang Town Park West, Bukit Batok, uh, Bukit Gomba, you know, a lot of fragments worth studying. How much, how long does it take for tree, uh, a fallen tree to decay in these places? How much seed dispersal is there? What's the degree of nutrient cycling in these different forests? Do they have fungi um, that are important in tree establishment? So our colleagues, our friends, uh, our saviors at national parks have un undertaken a large-scale forest restoration action plan. And I think we could take some of the lessons from Bukitima to not just maybe rely on species reintroductions, but really to monitor the functionality of these forests. Are they cycling nutrients? Do you find um, any, any impact of the loss of decomposers? You know, so is decomposition still happening? Are, is carbon being taken up? Do we still have evidence of pollination and not so much pollination limitation and so on. And finally, you know, do we have these important fungi that are needed for the establishment of some of the tall, majestic dipterocarp trees that more or less kind of govern the natural cyc cyclical nature of the forest? Um, recovery is slow. Siu Chin, who's on this call, uh, documented this almost 10 years ago. And uh, again, that's something to consider too. How do we speed up the recovery? Just planting trees won't do it because we'd still have to wait for 100 or 200 years at least for them to get really big. How do we ramp up forest restoration and forest function? See, here's Shoria Curtisia. I just, this is just gratuitous flora photos, uh, Dipterocarpus, right? So we can plant them where we get the pollinators. And here's a boletus. These fungi form symbiotic relationships with uh, dipterocarps. In fact, those are shoria leaves. I never noticed that down at the bottom. Uh, the, these fungi live in symbiosis with, with these trees. So again, I think we really need to pay attention to forest function. Um, we have a long, wonderful tradition of natural history, uh, biodiversity study, uh, looking at the biology of individual species. We need to take all of this expertise, I feel, and put it together and really map out how are these different elements coming together to contribute to a sustainable and resilient uh, forest system. I want to thank again Marcus and Kanan. You've been very patient with me <laughs> over the past few weeks. You've been amazing. And I want to thank all of you for being here. I hope that. Um, a new generation of researchers, and I see many of you here today, will be able to kind of pick up and take this a lot further. We need you. We don't have much time to protect these last bits of our natural heritage from degrading. And again, I'm convinced that with the talents that we have here, and maybe with a little bit of inspiration from International Biodiversity Day, we're going to get over this impediment and, and really bring our forests back to the thriving, robust ecosystems that every Singaporean deserves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sean. That was a really good talk. I learned a lot. Um, we have a bunch of questions in the chat, so I'll just pick out a few of them okay. for you. All right. So. Um, one of the earliest questions was, um, so you spoke about plantain squirrels as dispersers. Yes. But what, what about uh, alternative dispersers like civets and long-tailed macaques? Yeah, I, I should have said that, you know. Macaques are very important for sure. Uh, and if you look at some of the, it's been, well, we've, we've known macaques for the longest time. And Peter Lucas and Richard Corlett had done this work almost 30 years ago. And they did find that these macaques were, eating many, like over a hundred species of, of, of fruiting, you know, of, of fruits. So yeah. yes, macaques, super important and civets. And I didn't mean to, to um, uh, do any disservice to the primate and civet researchers. No, <laughs> absolutely. But so, so it, if you have a basic system with a macaque and a civet and a squirrel 
and maybe some bull bulls, will that be enough? We think maybe it, it's enough. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it'd be much better if there were if there were gibbons and hornbills and trogons and those things too. But you know, what's the, what's the ba again? The question is, what's the bare minimum needed to move stuff around th that you don't start getting this dispersal limitation? And I think okay. Yeah. So we think fulfill the basic function first, and then we can add species after that. But really, you know, if, if it's a restoration effort, get the basic complement there, and then I think we're the, that forest is in good shape. Okay, that's good. Um, next question is, uh, you mentioned that the wild boar started coming back. So when you say come back, did they like physically swim over from Malaysia? Or was this like a uh, wild boar that already in Singapore that just started expanding their populations? Yeah, I should ask Marcus and other experts on this call. But from, from what I understand, in the 1990s survey of Bukitima, there were none recorded. And in fact, it was believed, if, if I'm not mistaken, that the wild boar were not present on the main Singapore island. They were on Ubin and Takong. And okay. they first, yeah, then they first started turning up maybe late 90s, early 2000s, Western catchment, and then you would start finding them around the upper Solitar area. And then they spread, once they hit lower Pierce about, you know, 10, 12 years ago, then they really took off. And they started turning up in Bukitima, oh, maybe about five years ago, I, 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 I think. Okay, so they kind of just like saw the opportunity and took it then, I guess. Well, that's amazing too, because again, work that was done uh, out of the Reint lab, um, if you look at Co et al. and some of the work in the Raffles, Raff Bull, uh, the Raffles Bulletin of Zoology, um, they're finding that these boar are amazing. There's genetic connectivity across the whole island, and that m means that these boar are able to go from the forest, negotiate the urban landscape or suburban landscape, get into another patch of forest, and yeah, so they, they are uh, pretty amazing. But my question is, um, uh, how will this impact forest function? Will this shift the balance in some way? Because they are really a uh, um, large, um, large animal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have another question on uh, seed dispersers. Uh, in the long run, do we have to uh, introduce large seed dispersers like uh, the rhinoceros hornbill or elemented hornbill into our Singapore reserves? Uh, in case they go extinct elsewhere, I kind of like I think I think what they mean is you introduce them to further propagate the forest. Do you think we will come to that? Yeah. So so I think and and people there there will be people who who might disagree with with me and uh, for very good reasons. M my sense is that with the civets, macaques, bubbles, and and even with the return of the pied hornbill, you know we're probably as far as just just fulfilling the basic requirement for seed dispersal. I think we have just about, you know, we're kind of Fred Flintstone car or my dad's car kind of <laughs> level. And of course, if we could bring in more things, that would be good really for conservation, uh, species conservation purposes, but not necessarily adding uh, to forest function. I think we'd really have to look at the small things, those insects that are doing things like wood decomposition, maybe pollination, nutrient cycling. I think that's the stuff that we need to really look into because that's okay. the things we know least about. Okay, I think that makes sense. Um, it was, uh, another question is, it was stated that most of Bukit Brown will be uh, cleared to make way for residential function by 2030. Is there anything we can do in reality to stop or minimize this from happening? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, on the one hand, just to say that it would be completely left as forested area with the big road going through it, um, that might be a little bit of an overreach. But maybe there is a, a especially since Singapore belongs to, the future of Singapore belongs to young Singaporeans. And uh, uh, some of these decisions may not necessarily be made or uh, or decisions made today could be altered in some way. I guess the question is, can, how do we, what's the creative way to use our land area to fulfill, fulfill basic requirements of housing, you know, commercial mm. development? And it may not necessarily come from taking existing green patches and building on them. It, maybe we'll find alternative ways. So I'm hopeful that we will not necessarily have to stick with a plan, land use plan, 
that was devised maybe 20, 30 years ago, not because those planners didn't do a good job, but the reality, uh, new technologies, new, new attitudes toward how much space you need and everything might change. Okay. Mm. I see, I see. Um, let's see. Uh, we have, I think we'll do maybe another three more questions and then okay. before we move on to the quiz. Um, how do we know that our biodiversity isn't simply on the slow downslope of an extinction debt? Okay. Um, that's a that's a good question, and I think you know people like the people uh, in Roman Carrasco or Ryan Chisholm's lab at NUS, and some some of the people who really are doing serious field study and documenting. I saw Ing Sin on you know here, and Sankar, you guys are looking at uh, herps. There probably is. I mean, all of the studies that I've looked at are suggesting that we've lost quite a few things and we will continue to lose species. I mean, it's, pr it's predicted by theory. Uh, there's only so much limited area that we have. Um, and so in some, especially the small fragments, we may lose some more. But on the other hand, we have areas like the um, central catchment that has more forest today than it had say 200 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Be because it got cleared very quickly. So maybe that area is an area that's actually not, not only will it hold the line on extinction, but maybe it's able to accommodate more species than it, than it has today, only because it's less fragmented and it's a contiguous piece of forest. So, so I don't think it's all downside. I think there's a lot of potential to uh, repay. We, we, we will be able to overcome some of this extinction debt in some groups of plants and animals. Okay, I see. Right, um, there's another one about uh, ecological states of habitats. So it can be quite challenging to uh, determine the baseline since ecology is quite complex. Yes. Does this affect restoration if you cannot determine a baseline? Uh, yes and no, yes and no. I, I think the um, having a baseline would be great. But I think both in terms of the plants and animals and, and, and increasingly the sort of the microbial component of an ecosystem, I think we're having a better and better idea of what is needed just to kind of, you know, again, if you use the Fred Flintstone car example, what would be mm -hmm. the stripped down basic functioning still, but still functional ecosystem. And as long as we can have those elements and use that to guide our restoration efforts, then we can slowly add in more components to, to add some resilience to it. But just to get to that basic level, I think we have uh, enough expertise. I mean, I saw Siu Chin is on this call and a few others who do this restoration work and Parks okay. colleagues. I think we, we know enough where we can get to the B Fred Flintstone plus. Mm -hmm. uh, we might even get beyond my dad's car kind of level. And oh, okay. uh, yeah, so I, I am pretty confident. Even without okay. the baseline, we, we can do something. Oh, that's great then. Um, right, let's do the last question. Uh, you talked about the invasive species that are limited only to forest fringes. Is yes. there a reason for this? And also how about invasive species like the Zanzibar yam? Uh, okay, so uh, I should, you know, there are a few people who are now looking quite closely at this invasive species issue. The Zanzibar yam, uh, a, a climber, a lot of these climbers are especially aggressive at forest edge type habitats. And so when you have small fragments with a lot of edge, that's where the climbers really go to town. And so I didn't mention this about the Botanic Gardens rainforest. That fragment not only has lost some function, I think it was particularly vulnerable to some species of climbers, including Zanzibar yam. So if you look at these really tiny fragments, you can see, you know, even some native climbers like Smilax really take over, but um, the larger bits of the central catchment seem not to have been negatively impacted by uh, these climbers. So again, it's a function, I think, of fragment size and fragment exposure. And okay. I think once we get a better handle on that, we'd be able to not only um, restore better, but also limit the incursion of these uh, aggressive uh, climbing species. Oh, okay. Excellent. Uh, I think uh, we will, I think, I think that'll be the questions for now. Thank you very much, Sean. That was an thank excellent you. talk. Uh, thank you everyone for, for, for uh, de dedicating your Friday uh, to this talk. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Sean. I think I've got uh, one more question for you uh, because you so far 
the previous three of our speakers are from NUS, and so maybe some of our regular people, uh, participants are familiar with NUS. Uh -huh. So maybe could you um, tell us maybe in in two or three minutes about um, the NTU Agent School of the Environment, how is it like working there, and what 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 the team is, uh, what's the aim of the of the team at uh, NTU ASC so that people um, in the SG STEM group uh, get to know them better. Oh, oh thanks, Marcus. So th thank you very much for, for this ch chance. Um, many of you know my, my ecology colleagues at, at NIE, uh, like Norman Lim or Beverly Goh, Professor Shirley Lim. And so um, they do a lot of organism uh, type studies and they're very good at that. My colleagues at the AS, the Asian School of Environment at NTU, um, it's a new group. There's about seven of us. And the focus here is, I think it's very nicely complementary to the, the fantastic team at NUS because the fo focus uh, within my school it's led our senior professor is uh, David Wardle, who's a very renowned and prolific ecology professor. It's really, they do these kind of whole system function type studies. So there's a lot of species knowledge, deep, deep, deep species knowledge within the NUS Department of Biological Sciences. And some of the NTU folks that I work with are looking at system processes, nutrient cycling, uh, what happens in the root zone, um, the kind of a network of insects within a forest community and how does that link to forest function. Uh, so Eleanor Slade is our insect ecologist. Kelly Anderson has a long experience working in Brazil and Panama. She looks at the importance of the contributions of the root zone below ground parts of a forest to the whole system function. Uh, David Wardle, my senior colleague, uh, does this feedback between above and below ground systems and, and other things as well. Um, please come for our talks. And then Janice Lee uh, is, is also in my department and she has the interface between land use change, ecosystem function and impacts on uh, local communities. So I, I, think, I think the two universities, I'm not sure by design, for, but for whatever reason, I think we, we complement each other quite nicely uh, so um, rather that we, we see it as a uh, that we want to add to the good work that's been done here for decades by the NUS team. Thanks very much. So I, I'm, I'm glad there is a there is a, a group in NTU that is looking at questions in Singapore and in Asia as well. So um, I think everyone would agree that this is such an informative talk. So maybe I'll unmute everyone and. Uh, like what we always do, we like to thank uh, Sean for uh, giving us such an interesting talk today. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> Sean. Buddy. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Thank Long time no see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, everyone, stay. This is not the end. Stay. Uh, the general email, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, now we're, this is the highlights. So you got to stay. So yeah, do stay for the second part of uh, the session, uh, which is the trivia. So thank you, Sean. Oh, I think he's muted himself. So uh, what's going to happen is, uh, before we move on to the trivia, uh, like um, we are, so Kanan and I are interested to find out what is the um, interest of people uh, continuing to uh, participate in SG STEM trivia and talk after the circuit breaker period. So after first, after 2nd June, we're going to try to get back some semblance of life in Singapore, but we're trying to see out what, uh, if people are still interested and if people are interested, when should we hold the, the best time to hold the talk? So I'm going to open up um, a poll that you uh, everyone will see. And so could you please answer what is the best time for you if we were to continue the SG STEM talks and trivia sessions after the circuit breaker period? And once uh, maybe about 80% of the people have voted, we would share the answers with you. 40% have voted. Yeah, we will like maximum votes because you know your vote counts, so go for it. We also uh, inserted a choice that likely wouldn't attend post circuit breaker. I know it's very brutal to us, but we need to know. 
78 people have voted, uh, percent have voted. And we'll just keep it on for a little longer. Yep. Still increasing. Because while we say, now. yeah, while we say post circuit breaker, we'll probably carry on with this timing during phase one of the uh, post circuit breaker. Because I think things are not going to be that different. So for phase one, we might carry on with this. So this is more for phase two, give or take. So yeah. Right. So 87% okay. have voted. I think we can end the poll now, Marcus. And so let's see, you guys get live feedback. So it seems that weekday evening, so last week we got majority weekday evening. Uh, this week we get majority weekday evening as well. So yeah. that seems to be the preference everyone. Thanks everyone for voting. So we'll keep that in mind. Uh, so we're gonna move on to our trivia session now. Yes. So we'll wait for Kanan to get his screen ready. And yes, uh, I will do it now. So for joining us uh, this week, uh, well, our trivia session has, um, well, it's a fundraising trivia. So uh, those who have signed up will have received an email saying that everyone's encouraged to uh, contribute to the trivia pod, although it's optional. Um, and the winner of the trivia session would get to decide on the beneficiary of, uh, of today's session. So um, I'm going to post the link of how to access the trivia form. So we want everyone who's taking part to fill up the trivia sheet. Uh, it's a live Google form. And you just have to enter your team name. And there are four rounds, including a bonus round. And today's team is CBD because it's International uh, Day of Biodiversity, Biological Diversity, and plus a bonus round. Um, and everyone's supposed to update the Google Live sheet at the end uh, with your scores for the first three rounds and then we'll go on with that from there. And you also put in your, your team name and your beneficiary, right? So uh, we follow an honor code. Once the questions are uh, reviewed to you, um, answer them on a piece of paper or uh, type it up in your phone or text. And then at the end, you email it to us. We will check definitely the winners and we'll do a sampling of the others as well and send it to us uh, to our email address, right? So you can play with a team or you can play uh, solo, uh, but there is no looking up of answers uh, by Google or encyclopedias and whatnot. So uh, we'll let everyone, maybe give everyone about half, uh, 30 seconds, half a minute to take a look at the Google sheet, familiarize yeah. yourself, uh, put up your, your team name as well as your beneficiary. Uh, let's look at the sheet today. It looks like more than 80% have selected Acres as their beneficiary and two have selected the Nature Society of Singapore. So is it because our uh, speaker today is the president of NSS? Oh, so right. And uh, there is yeah, I was animal lovers late. Yeah. Uh, yeah, looks ready. People are still filling it up, but I think we can start now. Kanan yeah, will be our game master. Yeah, because we are kind of running slightly short on time, so we're going to try to get this done as quickly as possible. And those of you who are talking about releasing leopards and tigers in the chat, right, y'all can hit me up after this. I think we have a lot to talk about because I'm all for it. So uh, first part of C for CBD is chemistry. So I hope you guys are good in chemistry. So here we go. Question one. Mothballs go directly from the solid state to the gaseous state without passing through the liquid state. What is this process called? What is the process where solids go directly to the gaseous state without going through the liquid form? A, sublimation, B, deposition, C, vaporization, D, ionization. If you guys need any questions later, right, just drop in the chat. I'll go back to it later. Question two. Last week, we had a question about the effect of spicy foods about the effect spicy foods have on black soldier fly maggots. What is this chemical that causes the spiciness in chilies? A, chilium, B, spicesin, C, capsaicin, D, pepperin. What is the chemical that causes spiciness in chilies? A, chilium, B, spicesin, C, capsaicin, D, pepperin. All right. Question three, which is denser, 
ice a solid or water a liquid? Which is denser, ice or water? I know the coolness of the Pokemon does not count in your answer. Question four. What metal alloy, 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 do you get when aluminum and copper are combined? What metal alloy do you get when aluminum and copper are combined? A, adamantium, B, alumel, C, duralumin, D, turn. Is it, is it turn, Marcus? Yep, it's turn. Okay. Right, what metal alloy do you get when aluminum and copper are combined? Now let's go to question five. Ooh. Which of these chemistry topics was recently announced to be removed from examination at the GCE O level this year by the Ministry of Education? Which of these chemistry topics was recently announced to be removed from examination at the O level this year by MOE? A, electrolysis, B, organic chemistry, C, redox reactions, and D, metals and reactivity. Okay, if no one has any issues, we will carry on to question to the second sec uh, section. So A, electrolysis, B, organic chemistry, C, redox reaction, and D, metals and reactivity. And the B in CBD stands for biodiversity. We've tried to keep it local, so here goes. First described in 1860, which of these organisms is uh, Chelodipterus singaporensis? First described in 1860, which of this is Chelodipterus singaporensis? Is someone playing music in the background? Marcus, is it you? I think everyone is muted except... Uh, Both of us, right? No. It's a phantom music that is piped in. Okay, cool. Yeah, guys, try to keep keep your, your mics muted so that I know I don't get distracted. As if I needed more distractions. I think they are not allowed to unmute themselves. Oh, they can. Right, mm, next question. I think they can, yeah. Right, question two. Which of these primates was first described by Sir Stanford Raffles? Which of these primates was first described by Sir Stanford Raffles? A, the Sunda slow loris. B, the long tailed macaque. C, us, D, Bandit Langer. Which of these primates was first described by Sir Stanford Raffles? Sunda Solaris, long tailed macaque, us, the human being, and D, the Bandit Langer. Uh, moving on, question three Which is Singapore's longest venomous snake? Which is Singapore's longest venomous snake? A, the king cobra. B, the blue Malayan coral snake. C, Wegler's pit viper. And D, equatorial spitting cobra. There are two responses from uh, Ying Sing and Ying Tong. Yay, snakes. Yeah, I, I, I knew you guys would enjoy this, you know. And I know the, the, the herb sock people enjoy this, so here goes. Because I understand that, you know, like the, the, nature, the nature people are divided into like different groups, vertebrates, fish, birds, reptiles. So every week we try to bring in something different from each of the groups. So, yep. Question four. Dioscoria sensibarensis. Dioscoria sensibarensis is a weed that spreads rapidly in open and sunny areas clinging onto trees for sunlight. This hinders the growth of young saplings in the long term. What is, is the common name that refers for this plant that refers to a comic book character? What is the common name for this plant? So obviously it has got its original common name, right? But it also has got a local name that we use, which is slightly more comical. And I'll give it to you, right? It's not poison ivy. because I know poison ivy is a comic book character. So it is not poison ivy.
So what is the common or local name for this plant that refers to a comic book character? Of course, it has got another local name, which I'll tell you guys later in the fun facts for you section. Uh, moving on to question uh, five. How many species of freshwater crabs are endemic to Singapore? How many species of freshwater crabs are endemic to Singapore? One, two, three, or four. And uh, endemic means they're only found in Singapore, Singapore and nowhere else in the world. Well, I like playing these quizzes because I learned so much more. So like, I probably learned like all of these, answers all these questions when I was planning them. Didn't know any myself before this, so yeah. How many species of freshwater crabs? One, two, three, or four are endemic to Singapore. Okay, and moving on. Yes, the D in CBD is dogs because um, we thought we would make it slightly less scientific because I felt like chemistry and biodiversity was very textbook heavy. So let's, let's take it chill. Which of the following breeds of dogs is not banned in Singapore? Which of the following breeds of dogs is not banned in Singapore? A, the Akita, B, the Neapolitan Mastiff, C, American Bulldog, and D, British Bulldog. Which of the following dog breeds is not banned in Singapore? Akita, Neapolitan Mastiff, American Bulldog, British Bulldog. Okay, right, another woody question. HDB flats are allowed one dog that stands at 40 centimeters at the shoulders and weighs 10 kilograms maximum. Under Project Adore, flat owners can now adopt selected local crossbreeds. What is the height limit for these selected dogs? A, 45, B, 50, C, 55, D, 60. Under Project Adore, what is the height limit, the new height limit for selected local crossbreeds? 45, 50, 55, 60. I must say, I didn't know the answer to this question either. I didn't know the limit was 40 centimeters as well, like the previous limit, so yeah. All right, moving on. Which of these two dogs is an Alaskan Malamute? Which of these two dogs is an Alaskan Malamute? The other dog in question, as you can see from the link at the, at the bottom, is a Siberian Husky. So it's literally a case of Husky versus Malamute, A or B, is the Alaskan Malamute. I can see like some faces at the bottom of my screen and they all look quite like stressed out. So I'm like, hmm, okay. Okay, which of the following is not a breed of dog? Which of the following is not a breed of dog? A, Barbet, B, Tamburan. C, Bolognese, D, Alva. Which of the following is not a dog breed? Barbet, Tevoran, Bolognese, Alva. Mindy just went finally in, in the chat. So I assume she's been waiting for like dog related questions for a long time now. All right, moving on, last question. Marcus loves these kind of questions about pitting animals against each other. What weighs more, eight min pins or one standard Doberman pincer? Pincer, yeah. What weighs more, eight miniature pinches, pincers or one Doberman pincer? Last week, uh, yeah, the, yeah, go on, the, the images of the dogs are not to scale. Ah, yes, they are not. Kavit. Okay, so apparently they are pronounced pincher. Thank you, uh, Chua Sekwan. Sikchon. Sikchon. Yeah. Sikchon, thanks. So, uh, yeah, and uh, we are going to go through the answers now. So, get ready to self mark. And uh, like I said, we'll try to move move to them as quickly as possible because we have hit five o'clock. And I'm going to pull up my notes so I can give you guys all of the fun stuff. Let's go. 
Sublimation is a process where mothballs go directly from gas to from solid to gas state without passing through the liquid state. Another um, uh, chemical that does this or compound that does this is the is dry ice, where it goes from solid to gas. And uh, the opposite of sublimation is deposition, where they go from gas to solid. Okay. And last week's question for based on last week's one, the chemical is capsaicin. That's the one found in uh, chilies and gives them the spicy taste. Fun fact, birds are not affected by capsaicin. And if you feed a chicken exclusively chili peppers, they will lay eggs that are red, like the egg yolk is red, not yellow. But I don't know if it makes it any spicier though. So yeah. The rest of the chemicals are all, I made them up. Three, liquid is denser. And that's the reason uh, ice, water is denser than ice. That's the reason why ice floats in water when you drop them in a cup. Four, the metal alloy you get is duralumin. When you, copper, cop, when you combine copper and aluminum, it's duralumin. Five, organic chemistry was the topic that was recently announced to be removed from the O-level syllabus at the end of this year. Yeah, that's because um, of the COVID-19 situation, so MOE is reducing syllabus. So for, at the primary school, PSLE level, they actually removed the ecology for primary school syllabus. Which so is one of the more important there. things now. <laughs> yeah, in this a pandemic situation where there's a possible zoonosis of all things removed zoology, uh, ecology. Yep. <laughs> all right. All right, biodiversity answers. This is Chelyodotrus singaporensis, which is a cardinal fish. Uh, fun fact, the other two plants which were there also have singaporensis as their uh, species name. One of them was magnolia, Singaporeans and I can't remember the other one. I'm sorry, but yes, this fish. And uh, so uh, there's a question that asks, uh, "What teres means?" So teres actually means um, wings. Probably it alludes to the fin. So if you go back to the last photo, um, so chilo actually means lips. Uh, di means two. Uh, teres means wings. So it's a, a lip with two wings. Uh, Singaporeans from Singapore. So it's an interesting fish. Right. Uh, goes to a snap then length of about 18 CF hours. I, I found out. Uh, next stage. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so Stafford Raffles described the long tail macaque. Uh, in addition to being a founding, one of the founders of modern Singapore, uh, Raffles was also a naturalist and he founded the Zoological Society of London and the London Zoo. Not say he did a good job at that because he was made to pay like a huge fine when he went back to London, but he founded them as well. And Singapore's longest venomous snake is the King Cobra. And in addition to, be sing in addition to being Singapore's longest, the King Cobra is also the world's longest venomous snake. So um, the King Cobra actually uh, eats other snakes, but the, there is emerging uh, evidence now that it also goes uh, for monitor lizards. It's always good to spice up your diet. And also any snake with the word king in it means it's a snake eater. So like king snakes. So this plant is the Batman plant. So apparently both Vargas and I cannot see the Batman shape, but it is locally known as the Batman plant. And it is also known as the Zanzibar yam, which was uh, talked about earlier during Sean's talk. So, so NPARS actually biggest... has a um, removable program for this uh, species. So if you're interested in helping the forest in Singapore, especially the, the age, age of the forest, uh, they do have they are, do, they are looking for volunteers to remove uh, this plant from our nature reserves. So Ivan asked that, uh, has a fun fact saying that the king cobra is likely to be split up several distinct species. That's right. Um, the king cobra in Indochina looks very different from the king cobras in Southeast Asia. Oh, uh, Brandon know. asked, what if we got half the name right, Batman? Yeah, so if you say Batman plant or ba Batman climber, Batman yam, um, Kanan, what do you say? Yeah, you know what, I think if you get Batman, let's go with it, you get the point. Alrighty. Yeah, because what Batman was looking for, 
And there are three species of endemic uh, freshwater crabs to Singapore. Uh, they are the Singapore freshwater crab, Johora singaporensis, reticulated land crab, uh, Paratha reticulata, and Johnson's freshwater crab, Imengardia johnsoni. And they are in the yes. order that I just read them. So the top one is uh, Singapore freshwater crab, reticulated land crab, as you can see from the markings on his carapace. And the last one is Johnson's freshwater crab. Uh, interesting fact is that the Singapore freshwater crab and the reticulated swamp crab are in the top 100 most critically endangered species in the world uh, by IUCN. So this is what we wanted to highlight it. So Singapore has a dubious honor of having two of uh, the top 100 most critically endangered species in the world. Ooh. And let's move on to dogs. Let's see, let's see what the dog lovers have got it down. I assume at this point we have to do a cat lovers at some point as well for the other group. So uh, the breed that is not banned in Singapore is the British Bulldog. The rest of them are all banned. And apparently British Bulldogs go to space as well as you can see from this picture. The bark side of the moon, they called it. That, that was literally the name of this article when I found this picture. So yeah, uh, British Bulldog is not banned. And uh, under Project Adore, the uh, cro local crossbreed dogs that you can pick up can be at a maximum of 55 centimeters. 55 centimeters for local crossbreed dogs under Project Adore for HDB flats. B is the Alaskan Malamute, while A was a Siberian Husky. So apparently Huskies drop their tails while uh, Malamutes have them curled up and uh, Malamutes also are uh, larger, fluffier, and in terms of working dogs, Malamutes are stronger and they do, uh, they're, they're used for like pulling heavier weights. While they use more like working dogs, like proper working dogs, while Huskies are used more for like traveling and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Question four. Halva is not a dog breed. It is a sweet, usually found in places like Russia and it's made from sunflower seed butter. And uh, the other dogs in the picture are the uh, ones. So the one in the middle, the fluffy brown one, that is the Barbet. Uh, the German Shepherd-like one is a Tavoran, which is also a city in Belgium. And the white fluffy guy is a Bolognese. So Halva is the not dog breed. And carrying on, last one, which weighs more? A doorman pincer weighs more. The average min pin weighs around four ish kilograms, while the uh, average doberman weighs at about 38 kilograms. So one doberman weighs much more than uh, eight min pins. And I put two dormans there just to like, you know, cement the course. So yes, and now we will move on to the bonus round. And uh, as usual, our regular quiz okay. goes, you know how it works. So, but, uh, but yeah, Marcus, you want to explain, explain for the, the bonus round the, now? Yeah, for the new yeah. people. So please um, total up your scores for the different rounds. And I would need all participants to fill up the Google sheet what your total score is. Um, let me just write a formula, sum equals two. all this and with your total score uh, you get to do a wager of your uh, for the bonus round so how this works is that you can wager your points this is for people who are behind now to really catch up uh, with the rest um, and you can wager from one point up to the maximum number of points you have so let's say you've got all three uh, round full marks, you get 15 points. So you can wager up to 15 points. And what happens is that if you get the bonus question correct, you gain 15 points. But if you get the bonus point wrong, you lose 15 points, right? So this is a critical thing. And some people learn that if they wager all their points, uh, there's, there's likely they, they might win, but there's also a likely chance that you might lose, right? So fill up your wager amount uh, on the Google Sheet, please. And we would reveal the bonus question once everyone fills it up. Yeah, and also I say this every week, do not wager more points than you already have, right? It doesn't work that way. You can't come and drop a hundred points. So we are right. waiting for uh, Tim Lester. 
Yep. And also, yeah, people are asking about how about overweight min pins? No, man, we're talking about like decently weighing min pins. We can't have overweight dogs on this thing. They're just yeah. going to throw yeah. everything out. Yeah. We follow our weight recommendation, standard weights by the American Kennel Club. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, if you heard Malamute stock, they're very vocal. Yeah, while I was reading about the whole Malamute versus Husky thing, apparently Malamutes are very friendly and uh, while they're quite protective as well, but apparently they are very good with children, so they're very vocal. But Huskies are kind of like on the quieter side of things. So yeah. I, th I think it's usually uh, us Malamutes that are making all those like human-like sounds when they start arguing back to their to their owners and stuff. I think it's quite adorable. Okay, so I shall think, we? Yes. Uh, yeah. All right. So I think Lucas is still filling it up. Yeah, but let's go on. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the question comes from Sean Stock earlier. So this is to check whether you guys are paying attention. Uh -huh. Habitat clearance leads to species loss. How much? proportion natural habitat has been lost in Singapore's history. So give us in terms of like a percentage on how much habitat, natural habitat has been lost in Singapore's history. Sick Chuan's answer is too much lah. <laughs> that is true. Too much has been lost. But we, we, we need a number. We need a number. Yeah. So we want a percentage. Right, so uh, I was thinking about this. Um, we will give it to you if it's 5% either side. All right, so X, right? X percentage, X plus five, X minus five, we'll give it to you. Anything more, anything less, we will not give you the point. Instead of uh, slamming a solid number down. What do you think, Marcus? Um, not including reclamation. Well, Sean actually said that, that figure at least two or three times in his talk. Okay. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> Marcus is driving so, a hard bargain. You guys give me the exact number, man. I try to help you all. Exact number. <laughs> no, I think we could we could go um we could go we could go ten percent more, but not okay. less. Okay. We could we go do that? All right, ten percent more. So you guys have between X and X plus ten. No, no, nine percent more and not less. Nine. Less okay, so X to <laughs> X plus nine percent more. All right, uh shall I reveal the answer? Uh, okay. All right, bonus round. How much habitat have we lost? More than 90%. We have lost more than 90%. So we will accept anything between 90 to 99%. Yes. Yeah, uh, we, we're not giving any bonus for 90% on the dot, but we will accept anything from 90 to 99%. So uh, you guys can drop your thing. Marcus will look and let us know who the uh, unofficial winner is and uh, while Marcus is doing that, you guys uh, can send us your answers as well. So we may check them later and announce the official winner. And you can update your scores at uh, tinyurl.com slash sgstem dash trivia. Oh, and don't leave yet because uh, we will announce about next week's speaker and we will take our Wi-Fi so we know who were all in attendance. Yep. So we've got several uh, questions. What about reclamation terrestrial only? Uh, what about marine? Uh, unfortunately, our focus today was on terrestrial habitats. 90% um, not accepted. Um, do you want to accept 90%? Kana? Yeah, yeah, we will accept 90. We'll accept 90, Maxine. We'll take 90 to 99. So yeah, let's go for that. Uh, yes, uh, Stacy, we have recorded the talk and it will be on our website and on YouTube within the next two to three days. By Monday, you will have it there so you guys can go and catch up on it. Or if you guys want to go and take notes and stuff from Sean's talk, you can do it. Yeah, okay. But I want to confess, uh, my bad again, I hit the record button a bit late. Yeah, so we missed a few front slides, but it's, it's not... So, uh, uh, but we will have the meat of the talk. Oh, I tend to do a summary. Yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah, if you do a summary for what we missed in the earlier bits, that'd be good. Um, so, the, uh, yeah, so next week, okay, you guys can do the trivia part as well. I keep forgetting what oh, the slide is. I, I see from the trivia sheet that we have a tie. Ooh, okay. You guys can yeah, fight it but out. <laughs> I think a tiebreaker is not required because both winners, uh, unofficial winners, we're going to check your answer. Yes, yeah. have the same beneficiary selected. 
which is okay. That, that's good. That's good. If not, I was going to throw in a dinosaur question because you know when you need a tiebreaker, all these yeah. play dinosaurs. So good. We don't need a tiebreaker. I can keep my dinosaur questions to myself. And so, uh, for next week, the unofficial uh, winners. Wait, wait. I have to announce who they are. Okay, go for it. Go for it. So go for it. Our unofficial no. winners are Kanan's magnificent beard. So excellent. Announce it. You know what? That <laughs> that, is a, second, that is excellent team name. Excellent team name. Second um, uh, winner is uh, unofficial winner is the Fibbers. So congratulations well to our unofficial winners. So uh, we will check the answers and then we will tally up the amount in the trivia pot. I think when we started, it was at least forty dollars. Yes, uh, it was. I haven't checked since. Contributions come in throughout and even to the night. So we would update the website when that happens. But um, seems that the money, the the donations will go to Acres this time. So uh, yep. can I Yeah, so you guys can just keep sending the money in, right? It's over here. You guys can take a screenshot and something. Okay, fine. Noah, I'll stroke my beard. Well done. Well done for winning. <laughs> and then uh, for next week, we have Winston. Uh, as our guest speaker, I'm not too sure whether Winston is in uh, with us today. But so uh, next week we have, yeah. So uh, the registration link is live, right? Tinyurl.com/sgstem202529. You guys can go start signing up for next week's talk. Um, yeah. So Winston's going to be talking about does COVID-19 change anything about climate change? which I think is a hot topic now going across many countries, especially in Singapore as well. We, start, we touched on this slightly in our first session with uh, Koli and Bin. So let's see what more Winston has to add, add to it. And um, so we, are, we will let also next week, we'll let you guys know whether we are going to continue with Friday uh, afternoons or whether we are going to pick a new date sooner or later. But for now, it's still on the Friday. Right, so... Mm -hmm. Um, well, thanks everyone. We're going to take a group selfie, so uh, don't leave. And oh yeah, get the cameras on. Yeah. And then bring and bring so, your pets to the front if you have them. Yeah, and I just want to just before we all go, just thank everyone for joining the and supporting this great initiative by Kanan and Marcus. I mean, you guys really stepped up and provided a, a fantastic service to to not just the nature community, but a much wider one i mean hats off to you guys you're doing an amazing job and good luck with the rest of your phd programs thanks Thank so you. much john and thanks for joining Thank us too okay so i'm gonna take a first photo i think we spread over two pages so the first photo would come now smile yeah. and then the second page would come People, people are still streaming in for the pictures, but yeah, go for it. Oh, okay. I'll just take several yeah. and take the best ones when people are not blinking. This is my um, manual <laughs> smart camera mode. Just take the photos so people are not blinking. Uh, Fair enough. Piece them together. All right. All is done. So thanks for joining us. I uh, hope to see you next week and happy long weekend and Salamat Hari Raya. Uh, Thank yeah. you, everybody. Thanks, Marcus, Kanan. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for okay. everything. We do this every week, guys. So we're doing this again next Friday. So we will see you next Friday. And uh, remember, stay home, stay safe, and stay connected with science. Bye-bye now.